Ambassador Jan Prashad, Brigadier Romel Dahia, distinguished guests, a house full of friends, ladies and gentlemen. I thank the IDSA and the ambas Ambassador Jan Prashad for inviting me today. Over the years, these annual conferences of the Institute have shed useful light on questions of regional and global security. The list of participants include a good many experts who would speak authoritatively on various aspects of the theme of the conference and put forth different perspectives. I would therefore confine myself to a backdrop that might help understand better the context and the challenges emanating from it. Periods of turmoil and unexplained happenings are often depicted as a spectre, an impending danger. Such a spectre today seems to haunt all those who look at the region of Western Asia and North Africa. The apprehensions emanate from a dangerous mix of real politic and professed ideology that challenges the status quo in the region and has become a threat to regional and world peace. Two years back, the world observed the centenary of the First World War. It was described by a historian as the first calamity of the 21st, 20th century, the calamity from which all other calamities sprang. One dimension of it was the Sykes-Picot Agreement of May 1916 that, together with the San Remo Arrangement of April 1919, brought into existence most of the modern state system in West Asia. In 1945, it acquired its own sub-regional system in the shape of the Arab League. It is this edifice of post-World War I states and of newly induced nationalisms that now seems to be unraveling. Analysts of the future would record the year 1948, 1967, 2003, and 2010-11 as turning points in the modern history of West Asian lands. The first inducted Israel into the region, the second and its aftermath put an end to political Arabism, the third marked the destruction of Iraq and its resulting immediate and remote consequences, and the fourth signaled the commencement of the so-called Arab Spring or Arab turbulence that shook the authoritarian order. The new states in the region, with the exception of Egypt, lacked historical legitimacy and needed to create a national sentiment to reinforce the existing tribal, often fragmented, ties of cohesion within their territorial jurisdiction. This local patriotism was sought to be combined with amorphous and romantic sentiments of pan-Arabism, some of which were reflected in the 1945 Charter of the Arab League. Neither could develop an ideological underpinning that would bring forth widespread public commitment except as a formality. This was furthered by the fragility of the institutions of the new states. These were patriarchal, authoritarian, and hegemonic, and evoked fear of the state rather than a commitment to its objectives and ideals. Thus, the domestic impulse for social cohesion were insufficiently empowered and did not accommodate diversity in sufficient measure and were susceptible external pressure. This found its reflection in all aspects of governance which remained essentially non-participatory. The socio-economic backdrop too 
was not conducive to stability and social peace. Some years earlier, three successive UNDP Arab Human Development Reports highlighted the shortcomings of knowledge, freedom, and gender. The Davos Economic Forum reports on Arab competitiveness put the focus on the implications of population growth and youth unemployment and on the need for education and skill development to bring about a shift away from total dependence on the rentier economy. Pervasive rural poverty aggravated the situation. As a consequence of the erosion of the legitimacy of the broadly secular nation state and the ideological vacuum created by it, various versions of Islamist solutions were presented as indigenous, more authentic, and viable alternatives. Nor is this an altogether novel recipe since religion or religious symbolism as a force have been used in many societies for different purposes throughout history. Sociologists have dwelt on it at some length and making a distinction between different kinds of politics and different senses of religion have sought to develop a typology to classify these into one politically relevant religious religiously conditioned political action, three, religiously relevant political action, and four, politically conditioned religious action. Apart from the use and misuse of this instrumentality currently underway by many extremist groups, a few examples from the recent past can be cited. In the of the Egyptian defeat in the 1967 war, a perception took root that the Arabs have turned away from God and God has turned away from them. And this induced the government of Egypt to distribute in the armed forces booklets explaining the meaning of jihad. A similar step was taken by Iraq after its defeat in the 1990 Kuwait war and was visibly reflected in the new Iraqi flag. This was reinforced in subsequent years preceding, uh, preceding the 2003 US led invasion. In both instances, the purpose was empowerment. In both, subsequent developments were to the longer term consequences. Credit reports indicate that the fighting and the command component the recently formed Daesh or the Islamic State has within its rank many officers of the pre-2003 Iraqi army. Away from the Arab world and the most example of religious motivation for a political purpose was the resistance movement crafted to resist the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979. The United States, several Arab states led by Saudi Arabia and Pakistan implemented this successfully and in the process gave birth first to the Afghan Mujahideen and subsequently to Al-Qaeda. External happenings of the past left their mark on Arab societies. The process varied from country to country in response to a multiplicity of impulses, a common thread, a sense of distress, and a quest for a logical refuge. Thus came about re-Islamization of Arab societies at the grassroots level that provided or sought to provide solace and ideological underpinning. A deal has been written about this process in different societies. It has ranged. It has, part. It has ranged from anti-imperialist sentiments and socio-economic concerns to a re-emphasis on family values and cultural authenticity 
and has covered a broad spectrum ranging from traditional segments to the youth, professional classes, and the academia. The new channel communication through the internet and social media the moment. The latter also had its limitations and was not uniformly productive. One scholar has called it cyber utopianism. Despite the backdrop of an emergent social reality, the Arab turbulence of 2010-2011 was quintessentially a non religious secular phenomena that took shape of a leaderless mass movement seeking dignity, empowerment, political citizenship, social justice, and taking back the state and its institutions, rulers and their cronies. Its slogans, interestingly enough, did not resort to calls for Arab unity or advocate Islam as the solution. Its most dramatic impact was the abandonment of the fear of the secure apparatus of the state. At the same time, it was not united or harmonious and soon gave way to sectional interest. Uncontrolled rage did not help matters. Prospects of chaos were exploited by the counter-revolutionary forces to prevail, prevail and even impose greater control. Why did this happen? In a famous passage in his monumental history of the Russian Revolution, Leon Trotsky observed that the masses go into the revolution not with a prepared plan of social reconstruction, but with a sharp feeling that they cannot endure the old regime. The political process unleashed, he added, in a guided organization without which the energy of the masses dissipates. Record shows that in the case of countries affected by the Arab turbulence, the emergence of such a guiding organization happened relatedly and inadequately. There was no consensus on the political and economic model to be put in place. It was a tale of three battles rolled into one, people against regimes, people against people, and regimes against other regimes. The objective of the protesting masses ranged from modest reform and constitutional monarchy, as in Morocco and Jordan, and in a short-lived, muted manner in Saudi Arabia, to overthrow the head of state, as in Tunisia, Egypt and Libya, to a state order based on Islamic principles, as in Egypt under Morsi. The call for social justice did not, however, bring forth an implementable program of action. While cleaning groups and unions wanted higher wages and a reverse of privatization, others sought more liberal policies. One observer noted that the political scene in the Arab awakening is dominated by socio-political forces of the middle classes looking for a new socio-political system, one that is more just and free. But he added that there was no dominant political or organizational force. It is relevant to recall that the turbulence was not a single event, but a catalyst for a long-term change whose final outcome is yet to be seen. The main legacy of the Arab Spring is in smashing the myth of Arab political passivity and the perceived invincibility of arrogant ruling elites. Even in countries that avoided mass unrest, the governments took the questions of the people at their own peril. Panic characterized the initial reactions of the traditional Arab establishments whose primary objective 
was to maintain the status quo. Domestically and across the GCC, an authoritarian retrenchment and narrowing of political space emerged. Some of the GCC states took steps focused on firstly containment of the revolt in Tunisia, Egypt and Libya, secondly bringing about a counter-revolution in Yemen and Bahrain, and thirdly supporting the revolution in Syria. French scholar Jean-Pierre Filiou has described these as, has ascribed these to the work of the deep state conducting a systematic war of the Arab regimes against their people. Some questions arise. What were the principal characteristics of the authoritarian systems that were challenged by the two years of Arab turbulence? What were its immediate and longer term consequences? Did it have a visible impact on patterns of governance? What are its regional and global implications? According to most observers, the authoritarian order in West Asia and North Africa was and is characterized by lack of transparency, information scarcity, nepotism, political subservience, absence of a sense of equal citizenship, ambiguous accountability, political irresponsibility, and absence of rule of law. The effort in many cases to seek legitimacy through ritualistic references to religious injunctions about rule through mutual consultation and the requirement of obedience to those charged with authority amongst you did not alter this harsh ground reality. Those who protested against it sought the opposite of these attributes. The response part pattern with uh, local variations lent uh, credence to Machiavelli's dictum that men forget more easily the death of their fathers than the loss of patrimony. Voluntary abdication from seats of absolute power is a rarity in human affairs and did not have investigation lands. Three consequences emanated from this. They persist to this day. One was the initial gestures of financial largesse to their public along with an immediate resort to increasingly harsh measures to restrict the freedom of their citizens to express themselves and meaningfully to participate politically and hold power accountable. Another was a decision in some of the GCC states to give generous financial packages to the countries affected by the turbulence. A third was to intensify their military involvement in the internal conflicts in Bahrain, Yemen, Syria and Libya. Details of these are in the public domain. The continuing intensity of domestic controls has been commented upon by an observer. And I quote, counter-revolutionary Egypt, Saudi Arabia and Bahrain have rejected every pro-democracy demand raised in January 2011 and have implemented new decrees to ban popular demonstrations intended to celebrate the fifth anniversary of the uprising." End of quote. A good part of the debate on Arab turbulence and official pronouncements from different quarters has focused on alleged mischief emanating from the sectarian Sunni-Shia conflict. Its origins in recent time, recent years can be traced to the geopolitical consequences of the invasion of Iraq in 2003 and to the reported 2004 pronouncement of the Jordanian monarch. Some of the GCC states 
have been its proponents in recent years. According to one scholar, sectarianism became a preemptive counter-revolutionary strategy. This, however, clouds rather than illuminates the complex realities of regional politics. A more realistic perspective on this was provided by the Amir of Qatar, who, in his UN General Assembly speech of September 28, 2015, described the existing confrontation as political, regional, Arab-Iranian difference rather than being a Sunnicia dispute. The turbulence in Arab lands was not immune to regional and extra-regional inputs. Bahrain, Libya, Syria and Yemen were subjected to political and or material interventions from across national borders. Some of these emanated from within the region, some from immediate or proximate neighborhood, and some from great or big powers. The objective in each case was and is to prevent, retard, or reverse the change sought by a visible majority of the public. Another lecture would be required to mention the litany of sins on all sides. It would suffice here to say that regime change initiatives should be autonomous to the citizens of a state. Record shows that externally imposed strategies, even if used as a complement to diplomacy and deterrence, are perennially in danger of going down the slippery slope. The picture at the end of the year 2015 was one of total disarray, a situation in which regional and global powers, together with empowered local groups, are engaged in political and military action in half a dozen different battlefields. The immediate concern of each is to prevail upon its adversary. Little thought, if any, is being given to longer-term consequences for the societies in the region. In the process, the rationale for the turbulence takes a backseat. It has been said that the failure to understand catastrophes is even deadlier to a people than the catastrophes themselves. The requirement to comprehend the prerequisites and essentials of participatory governance were perhaps not fully comprehended by the protesting public, nor did it have a full measure of the forces aligned against it. The need to combine rage with realism went unappreciated, except in the case of al Nahda in Tunisia, where the requirement of a wider consensus was appreciated. With the exception of Egypt, the primary and primordial identity of the Arab lands of the former Ottoman Empire was essentially tribal with some regional attributes. As independent entities, no organic changes were brought about in their internal tribal structures. Instead, the tribal hierarchies were integrated in the new political structures deliberately by domestic and external forces that, despite protestations to the contrary, ended up being authoritarian. This deprived them of a mass base and genuine public participation through political institutions. Aspects of this deficiency were reflected in the UNDP's second Arab Development Challenges Report of the year 2011, which urged the need for a new social contract of mutual accountability in which the state becomes more responsive and accountable to the citizens. The link between the citizen and the state through the mechanism of accountability and an implicit, implicit social contract going beyond the ruler-subject relationship 
is thus critical for domestic cohesion and internal security, but has not been sufficiently in evidence. An analysis of the states of West Asia some years back identified amongst its characteristics the politics of limited association and of an essentially broad urban middle class base in which coercion or co-option into the state structures rather than in a durable resilience of the system whose legitimacy is based on full participation of the people in the body politic. Decades earlier, the Moroccan historian Abdullah Laroy had spelt out the requirement and I quote, the democratic principle means that no one in society possesses the political truth, that this truth will only gradually take shape through the procedures of discussion and successive elections, end of quote. The failure to imbibe and implement this in sufficient measure is thus central to the crises that have afflicted the region. Jai Hind. Thank you.